Hi, everyone. This is SJ Thomason with Christian-Apologist.com. And today I'm going to talk about a very important topic. And let me just switch up screens here so I can get to this extremely important topic. Let's see where we are. Okay, so we're going to chat a little bit about the book of John. And we're going to ask a question on whether the book of John is a forgery. Okay, so it's a really important topic that we're going to cover today. And let me just get set up here. Okay. So the big question is, is the book of John a forgery? The short answer is no, it's not a forgery. The long answer is no, it's not a forgery. Who wrote the gospel according to John? Many scholars believe the author is John, the brother of James and son of Zebedee, who was a fisherman who initially encountered Jesus in Matthew 4, 21, 22. In fact, we're told that Zebedee was a wealthy man or somewhat wealthy because he did have a fishing business. When James and John decided to leave with Jesus, when Jesus showed up, Zebedee had other people who could help him with the fishing. And also they were also working with Peter. So he knew Peter in advance, which is a pretty interesting little tidbit on the apostle John. So we have significant internal evidence that supports this assertion. This intention of this video is to provide this evidence which should help to refute faulty assertions by some skeptics that the Gospel of John is a forgery. Please don't think that. So of the 12 initial male apostles, Jesus identified James, John, James's brother, and Peter as his most prominent when he led those three up a high mountain to witness his transfiguration. And this is reported in Matthew 17, 1 to 13. Brothers James and John perhaps considered their special blessings when they boldly requested that each be seated at the right and left of Jesus once in his heavenly throne. That's recorded in Mark 10, 35 to 45, and of which the other 10 apostles disapprove. They didn't really like the idea that James and John were arguing over themselves being there. Of course, they also probably figured they should be seated at the right hand of Jesus' throne. And of course, as we know, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. So the Gospels give us fewer reports of John's brother James's actions, yet numerous reports of John's and Peter's. We know that Peter denied Jesus three times after Jesus had been arrested. We further know that Peter doubted his faith in Jesus when called to join Jesus as Jesus walked on water. Jesus considered Peter his rock upon whom his church would be built. In the Gospel of John, the author refers to the disciple whom Jesus loved numerous times, yet this reference is not present in the synoptics. In John 13, 21 to 27, when Jesus shared with his disciples that one would betray him, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was reclining next to him, was prodded by Simon Peter to ask Jesus which disciple would be his betrayer. So it's an important sort of issue. In only John's gospel, and this is sort of an interesting fact, in only John's gospel, um, we do learn that another disciple had followed Jesus when he had been arrested to the high priest courtyard to watch his trial. And that's reported in John 18, 15 to 18. The other disciple was known to the high priest, so he was given access. We can only wonder how the other disciple was known to the high priest. However, I would estimate that if Zebedee was a rather wealthy man. Perhaps Zebedee was very active in the synagogue, and perhaps he was known to the high priest in there. And as the son of Zebedee, perhaps that's how John got access, if this is John. The other disciple then led Peter into the courtyard, where Peter denied being one of Jesus' disciples to a servant girl. John also uniquely shared that the disciple whom he loved was standing nearby with Jesus' mother, Mary, during his crucifixion. You'll note that the women were there during the crucifixion and the disciple whom Jesus loved was there and the disciple whom Jesus loved is a male according to this account but the other men weren't there and that's what's sort of embarrassing testimony that's in the passages since it is likely Mary's husband Joseph had passed by that time since we have no mention of him at this point in Jesus's life Jesus gave the role over to his beloved disciple to care for his mother he said woman here is your son and to the disciple here is your mother from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And this is reported in John 19, 26 to 27. When the women discovered Jesus's empty tomb and shared the good news with Jesus's male disciples, Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb and the other disciple beat Peter in arriving. And that's reported in John three to four. And this is unique. Luke only reports Peter's trip to the tomb while the other gospels report neither. So it's pretty interesting that John 
uh, reports himself and refers to himself all, obviously in the third person, which is quite interesting. And I think it might be just a way to express his own humility in his relationship to Jesus. Just before Jesus's final commission, after he had resurrected and reinstated Peter, Jesus asked Peter wh whether he loved him three times, reported in John 21, 15 to 19. After each time, Jesus instructed Peter to take care of my sheep. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Jesus then portended the type of death Peter would face, which was an upside down crucifixion. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger and dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter then turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. The author indicated this disciple was the same as the one who leaned back against Jesus at the Last Supper and asked about Jesus' betrayer. This piece of information connects the accounts of one whom Jesus loved with the Last Supper, giving us evidence he is one of the twelve. Peter inquired about this disciple's fate. Jesus answered, if, you want, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? The author then noted that Jesus did not say that he would not die, but only if he wanted him to remain alive, what is it to Peter? And that's reported in John 21, 22 to 23. Like the details only John provides in the event of Jesus' arrest, crucifixion, and call to his disciple to take care of his mother, this event is only told in the Gospel of John, suggesting that the Gospel author had special knowledge of or special interest in the events when Jesus' beloved disciple appeared. The Gospel of John closes with these parting words. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true, reported in John 22, 24. The book of Acts then opens with speeches, travels, and persecutions of Peter and John. You can see Acts 4, for example. Peter and John were friends, and they were friends prior. Again, they were working together as fishermen. And so the fact that they traveled together and spreading the good news after Jesus resurrected is not a curious thing. So a strong case can be made, the disciple whom Jesus loved is John, the son of Zebedee, an author of the gospel according to John, because one, the author often refers to himself in this way throughout Jesus's ministry and the passion narratives in the book of John. Two, the author states that he and the disciple whom Jesus loved are one and the same in John 22, 24. Three, the only of the 12 apostles not to be martyred according to extra biblical accounts is John, whom Jesus gave over to watch his mother Think about that. Jesus knew which ones would be martyred and he knew which one would live out his life to the fullest extent. So he gave uh, John the responsibility of taking care of his mother. Now, Jesus' brother James was martyred in Jerusalem. And we learn from that from Josephus. And for the unique information we only learned during Jesus's arrest concerning Annas and Caiaphas is provided because the author was one in the same with the other disciple. Extra biblically, Justin Martyr, who lived between 100 and 165, quoted from the Gospel of John in his dialogue with Trypho the Jew, while Polycarp, who lived between 70 and around 155, includes quotes from 1 John and, and 3 John in his letter to the Philippians. Now note that 1 John and 3 John are um, also attributed to John the Apostle. Polycarp studied under John, as reported by Irenaeus. Irenaeus also reported that John remained at the church of Ephesus until the times of Trajan. Pliny the Younger documented the torture of Christians in his letter to the emperor Trajan. And so if we also want to find extra biblical information concerning the martyrdoms, we can find them from Pliny the Younger. We can find them from a number of other places, but Pliny the Younger is included in that long list of people who've noted the martyrdoms. No early church fathers or other extra biblical authors have attributed the Gospel of John to anyone other than John. Make a, a really big, strong note on that. Underline that because it's a very important point. When people try to claim that the book of John is a forgery, and right now there's an article out by Candida Moss uh, that's in the Daily Beast that's referencing another study that's also referencing things like Bart Ehrman's work on forged, please note that there's no ancient mention of anyone else Aside from John, there's no ancient mention that claims that the book of John is anonymous. There's no ancient mention that says the book of John is attributed to Mark or just anyone else. 
Uh, there's no ancient mention of anybody else aside from John. So the attributions are going to John. So just to be reasonable here and to use what the ancients are trying to tell us, let's let the ancients speak. They told us the gospel is attributed to John. So no, it's not a forgery. Sorry, plain people who have this uh, idea that it is, it's not gonna work. So the bottom line, the disciples whom Jesus loved also appears to be one of his most loyal, having followed Jesus rather fearlessly during his trial, appearing at his crucifixion, and following Jesus and Peter after Jesus' crucifixion. John likely recognized himself as one who didn't let Jesus down. Was the book of John a forgery? No. The other estimation that people have said about John is that he's probably a very young man, and that might have been one of the other reasons why he was able to get into the temple. Perhaps, uh, maybe he, as again, his father was a friend of uh, Annas or a friend of Caiaphas, and perhaps that was one of the reasons why they decided to let his son into the temple. That's, of course, completely something that I'm uh, thinking could be, be a case, but of course, I have no biblical support for that particular assertion. So let me come back to you and okay so now what i want to do is coming back to you guys i want to see if anyone has any thoughts or questions on this particular thing uh looking for a link to michael heiser looks like i want to mention i read the book by michael heiser called unseen realm and i also read angels by him and the books are fantastic so i'd highly recommend that so any thoughts or questions i want to say hi to people i see in the audience before i let you guys go so i want to say hi to john lloyd hi to Iger vision hi to the messenger reveals uh, hi to, where else did I see? Jesse Camping. So yeah, Jesse Camping, that's the conclusion. Was the book of John a forgery? No. <laughs> so it absolutely was not a forgery. Let's see who else I can say hi to. Hi to Jordan Rivers. So I really loved seeing all you guys. It's always so great to see you. Today is Wednesday, as you know. And uh, so this is just a really quick stream. I'm actually getting on in a couple of hours, less than a couple of hours, to talk to Bionic Dance. Her real name's Kate, but Kate is an atheist. And I was on with her not too long ago on G-Man's channel, and we were chatting with uh, actually Nathan Orman, who's in the, the uh, who's in the um, chat right now. And Nathan was also on the channel, and we were chatting not too long ago. So it was Nathan, Bionic Dance, me, uh, Veckel, and um, uh, G-Man, and so we were all having a nice conversation. And uh, so one of the things that Bionic Dance and I are going to continue is this conversation on do we have enough evidence for Jesus' resurrection or the claims for Christianity. And so I hope that you guys will come back. I uh, really appreciate seeing you. Again, I'm going to see you at uh, four o'clock. That's a little less than two hours. If you come back, we'll be chatting about um, some interesting things. I'm actually busy packing today because I have to... Um, I'm getting ready for a trip. And so I'm risking coronavirus. Yes, I will be on an airplane. So it's kind of dangerous, <laughs> but that's gonna happen pretty soon. So, um, and so Cindy, I, I think uh, who grows on you? I don't know if she's talking about me, but that would be funny if she is. So um, thank you so much, everybody. Please like and subscribe. We didn't get to answer the questions. Yeah, yeah Nathan, we, I'd like to bring you, I'll just mention before I let this go, Nathan, I'd like to bring you back on my channel if you want, or I could go on your channel. Uh, if you would like to do that, we can we can definitely chat some more and uh, continue the conversation. I know right now, so if you guys don't know Nathan's story, Nathan was initially, he was raised as um, uh, really a non-believer. He didn't have any particular denomination, if I understand this correctly. And then he found the Christian faith a couple of years ago, but he got hooked up with some people who were uh, sort of fundamental types, fundamentalist types, and uh, he didn't necessarily jive with them. And so one of the things that, that happened was, so I think they might've turned him off. And so he is gonna be, um, so now he's back to being agnostic. And so we, of course, as Christians, we wanna make sure that um, we talk to our brother as much as possible. Oh, Bionic Dance grows on you? Yes, I agree, Bionic Dance does grow on you. In fact, Bionic Dance is, I think she's actually a really nice person. Um, and thanks, Nathan. I think you are a really nice person too. Actually, I think everybody in the chat right now are great people. So thank you so much. Um, oh, so Bionic Dance has a latest video about Christianity. Yeah, so I don't know if that's what we're talking about, but um, an Iger vision. 
Anyway, okay, so we'll set that up. Um, as I said, I'm going to actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to bring my speaker here with me on my trip so that I can make some videos while I'm there. So you guys are going to see me at Jackson Hole and uh, it's going to be pretty funny. I'm going to definitely take some film. I, I'm going to film people skiing and so <laughs> film myself skiing. It's going to be really funny. If I wipe out, it'll be extra funny. So if you guys get to see a yard sale, you'll have a, that'll be a lot of fun. So. Um, all right, so she has a great video explaining what she doesn't understand. Oh gosh, I should listen to that before I talk to her, shouldn't I? I better do that. Maybe I should do that in the next hour while I'm running around. So I wanna say thank you guys. I'll be back here in a little over an hour. So I will talk to you soon and bye-bye.